You know, the story today lifted up this idea that sometimes we do some things that hurt others and we can't make them up. And we have to hope that someone else will be kind and do the right thing when we didn't. I've been wrestling with a big question for 21 years now. I came to Tulsa in 2000. It was just before the official 1921 Tulsa race riot, as it was still called a riot back then, report came out from the government of Oklahoma. And I learned almost immediately upon coming to Tulsa that one of the key founders of All Souls, the church I was coming to serve, was the owner and editor of the Tulsa Tribune newspaper and was therefore responsible for the May 31st front page article that many believed helped spark the worst race massacre of African Americans in American history. Now, every historical account that I have read says that that front page article accusing a young black man of attacking and assaulting a white woman was sensationalized news and was exactly the kind of accusation that sparked lynchings all over the nation back during that time. The editor, Mr. Jones, had to know that running that piece ran the danger and likelihood of stirring up anti-black violence. You don't accuse a black man in 1921 America of trying to rape a white woman without expecting violence in response. Now, I've been trying to figure out for a couple of decades now how a person could support the values of this church and also contribute to one of the worst atrocities in American history. Now, you might be saying, why bother, Marlon? The man was a racist in an era of racism. Call it what it is. Move on. I have not been able to move on. Members of his family have left the church since I came specifically because of things I have said about him from this pulpit. And I've wondered, have I been unfair? So I've read everything that I could find about Mr. Jones by Mr. Richard Lloyd Jones to try to understand who he was and what made him tick. Now, the easy thing to do in these times would be to cancel him, to make the claim that he was bad and we are good and we don't want to or need to have anything to do with him. The problem is I'm a universalist, which means I do not believe in hell and I believe in the inherent worth and dignity of every person. So I've wondered, can I have a pastor's heart? when it comes to his humanity, while maintaining a prophet's clarity when it comes to the harm that he caused. And I do believe that we can understand a person without defending what they've done or excusing it or justifying it. I've also wondered, what will happen 100 years from now in the light of history if something that I've said or done has caused harm. I mean, I'm out here spouting my opinions about injustice and offering visions for how people should live their lives every week. I say what I say because I believe it's right, but I would be foolish to think that I'm batting a thousand, as they say in baseball. It's hard to believe that over the course of time, every single position that I've taken will be seen as right. And righteous. What if the church discovers in the future that something that I did caused harm? It's probably inevitable that there will be something. I would hope that future generations will not cast me out completely as a bad man and a bad minister with bad intentions. Instead, I hope that they'll do what they can do 
with what resources I have left behind to try to heal and redress the harm that I've done. Try to help me and my legacy somehow in the spirit of community. So it's in that spirit of universalism and humility that I share with you my current conclusions about All Souls founder, Mr. Richard Lloyd-Jones. Let's begin by acknowledging that every one of us, everyone has beliefs and values that they hold dear and none of us live up to those beliefs and values in every way, every day. If you do, you're a saint. That's why people who become saints get so much praise because unlike the saints, the rest of us fall short of our values over and over and over again. Paul in the Christian Bible famously said, my spirit is willing, but my flesh is weak. We know we shouldn't eat that last piece of cake, but we do it anyway. We know we shouldn't talk about our neighbor behind her back, but sometimes we do it anyway. We know we should tell our boss that that bigoted joke was not okay, but we don't always do it. We should have included that income in our income taxes, but we didn't. Or we should not have taken that ream of paper or those pens home from the office. I could go on. The point is that To be human is to have a gap between what we value and believe and know is right and how we act. The whole purpose of religion is to help us close the gap between who we are and who we aspire to be. What I've learned about Mr. Jones one of the key founders of All Souls, is that he held a lot of contradictory views. He was intelligent. He was flawed. He was arrogant, almost to the point of narcissistic. But he was not a sociopath. And he wanted Tulsa to be a great city. Mr. Jones was a well-known journalist by the time he came to Tulsa. He was part of a group of journalists in New York in the early part of the 20th century, who pioneered what we know now as investigative journalism. He worked for Collier's Magazine, a major American publication famous for its social justice reporting. He went on to own a newspaper in Wisconsin, and he became a national figure in the Republican Party, the party of Lincoln. After reading all that I could from him and about him, I can say that He absolutely had contradictory impulses. But his main impulse was not to destroy the black community. His main impulse was to make his adopted hometown the greatest city in the world. He came to Tulsa after World War I and he was full of optimism. America was entering a new dawn, a new day where America would become a new dominant world power. America was heading into a new time and was expanding westward. His nephew was Frank Lloyd Wright, who was pioneering a new form of architecture and gaining in prominence as the greatest American architect who was revolutionizing his field and designing an aesthetic that echoed the optimism and the creativity of American democracy and its freedom and ingenuity. It was with this spirit of possibility and the idealism of a young man on the rise that he came to Tulsa, which he believed could become the new American city. Not burdened by the past like New York and the East Coast cities or the Deep South with all their traditions and history. Oil, and more importantly, oil money was flowing and growing abundantly. This city could be the expression of American potential in a new age. I have to admit, there is a lot of nostalgia these days about that era. We love to imagine it as this colorful era of art deco and oil mansions. 
But what Mr. Jones found when he arrived in Oklahoma was a vice-ridden city with a lot of corruption and a lot of violence. And he set out in the spirit of Collier's magazine to use his influence as a journalist to clean it up. You can read it in his editorials in the first few years of him taking over the paper. Now, let me paint a picture because we forget how many dirty deals and shady, violent things were going on back in the 19 teens and early 20s. I had a great talk with historian and author Russell Cobb this week, and he reminded me that land was being stolen from the Creek people and for all the tribal communities. You know, Hollywood right now is making a movie about Osage County and what happened back then. But the same kinds of things, and even worse in some cases, were happening right here in Tulsa. They were cheating people out of their land, marrying and then murdering women and children. People were disappearing. The Ku Klux Klan was on the rise, and so was vigilante justice. Just a generation ago, the Creek Indians had been thrust into a capitalist system and were trying to keep their culture in the midst of it all. African Americans, a generation or two out of slavery, were trying to make their way despite Jim Crow segregation and horrendous violence and terror against black people and communities across the country. And there was an oil boom flooding the place with money and opportunity. No one had ever seen this much oil before. And it was the most valuable resource of the age. And so corruption was rampant. It was indeed the wild, wild west. Now, that generation of white professionals who, like Jones, came to Tulsa from other parts of the country in the 19-teens and 20s, came to build their fortunes and to build a new kind of city here. They wanted to create a city on a hill to be a model of what America could become. And it looked to them like it was going to happen. That's why they called it Magic City. Look at all the art that was collected and the museums that were created. These men and women had a worldview that was steeped in Eurocentric ideas, and liberal democratic notions. Within the limited light of that worldview, they had good intentions. They wanted to do something historic, and they believed they could. Cobb described it as if they were caught up in a kind of fever dream of wealth and possibility. In their eyes, this was the new American frontier, and they were the lords of it. Was it steeped in highly problematic ideas of white European superiority? You bet it was. We see it, and we know how oppressive and wrong that worldview is. But to them, it was what they saw. It was what they thought. It shaped their notions of goodness and their visions of what was possible. They wanted Tulsa to be a shining city on a hill, but it became the national shame instead. They did everything they could to cover it up. And that included blaming the victims of the massacre for what happened. Because if it were the fault of black people, then maybe just maybe it would not reflect so poorly on the rest of Tulsa, the magic city. The callousness and blindness to the ramifications of their racism and their scapegoating was devastating, especially to black people. Let's take a breath and just take that in for a moment. We have to try to put in our minds that Mr. Jones saw himself as a good person. In fact, he probably thought of himself as one of the best persons. His contradictory impulses had him on the one hand, writing and speaking out against lynching and mob violence and vigilante justice, 
over and over again in his paper, he was adamant that mob rule was not the way to create a modern democratic society. But then in another editorial, at another time, he said, if the Tulsa police won't clean up the vice in Greenwood, then we might have to hire a thousand men to go in and do it on our own. Now, he might argue he was trying to goad the chief of police to do his job, but it sure sounded a lot like an endorsement of vigilantism and eerily like what happened in 1921. Was there vice in Greenwood back then? Of course there was. There was vice everywhere. Money was flowing, and there were people on all sides of the city making money off gambling and booze, prostitution, and scams of all kinds. But vice was far from the defining characteristic of Greenwood. Greenwood was an amazing place filled with some of the greatest people and entrepreneurs that Tulsa has ever seen. It was a strong community and a proud community for good reason. But reading Jones's editorials, you'd think Greenwood was merely a cesspool of vice and crime. Even in his times, and, and keep in mind, White people didn't go, most white people didn't go down into Greenwood, so they only knew about it from what they read in the papers. Even in his times, there were many people in his social standing who had much more enlightened views on race. And yet, I'm sure he would argue that he was not a racist. And this mindset is what is most important for us to understand today. How can a person imagine that they're not a racist and then say some of the awful things that he said about black people? The way Mr. Jones' logic worked was that he had a notion that there were two kinds of black people. There were good black people and bad black people. And so in his unfortunate and painful ideology, when he was denouncing black people in his paper, he would say he was describing what he saw as bad black people, not all black people. Now stay with me on this. I realized that I could lose everybody with some of these statements if you don't understand the context, because this is bound to hit you right between the eyes in just a moment. Most people who perpetuate racial stereotypes and inequality do not think that they're racist. Jones famously hosted Booker T. Washington in his home when other whites would not. He certainly considered Washington to be a good, quote unquote, black person. He would point to this story to show that he was not prejudiced against black people. And in his mind, he believed it. If a black person acted in accordance with the norms and values set out by white people like him, which to him were the only, the one and only and universally correct and appropriate norms, then he had no problem with them. Now this cultural myopathy and feeling of white European superiority has been devastating to native black and all non-white people throughout history. There's no reason to attempt, and there's no attempt here to try to justify or excuse it. All we can do is call it out for what it is and try to repair the damage in our own times. It's an instructive lesson for us because everyone, every one of us has a worldview that shapes how we see other people and how we see the world. Within the worldview that we have, we can feel that we're a good and righteous person while inadvertently doing harm. Think about it. If we're convinced that climate change is a hoax, then we can take actions that harm the environment without feeling guilty and without in any way seeing ourselves as bad. If we're convinced that the, an election was stolen and that American democracy is being destroyed before our eyes, then we could participate in mob violence at the Capitol in Washington while thinking that we are saving rather than degrading our democracy. Nevertheless, neither 
A narrow worldview or believing a lie excuses anyone from responsibility for their actions. By trying to understand Mr. Jones, I'm not trying to free him of responsibility. I'm trying to see what we can learn about the human condition that allows people to hurt others while thinking they are doing good. Let's be clear. Christians who believed in Jesus devoutly were slaveholders. Christians who were devout in their faith participated in the Ku Klux Klan. The question for you and me is how do we make sure that we're not caught in our own narrow worldview that causes us to objectify others and keeps us from realizing our own full humanity and the full humanity of others. Mr. Jones said and did some things that we must denounce in no uncertain terms. Yet Mr. Jones is not that different from us. We share some of his same aspirations for good and for our city. And we share the part of his human nature that causes people to be unaware of our blind spots. Mr. Jones himself is not the actual enemy. He's a symptom. He's not the one who needs to be eradicated or canceled. White supremacy and and any ideology that turns people into objects and causes people to feel superior to other people is what need to be canceled and eradicated. The only answer to this human limitation that exists in the heart of all human beings is to be in a culturally diverse community of people who honestly and freely listen to one another and to allow ourselves to be shaped and moved by the experiences and the truths that others have and bring forward. Authentic relationships of equality are the answer to the dangers of objectification and commodification of other people. Mm. If we're going to create a society that's safe and just for all people, we need to be in relationship with people who are... of different gender identities, of different sexual orientations, and people of other religions, and diverse social groups, and economic backgrounds. You know, it's easy to have an opinion about transgender youth in sports if you're not in relationship with anyone who's dealing with that situation. It's easy to think that something is not a problem just because it's not a problem for you. If We live in silos. We will die from our separateness and harm others along the way. The promise of this age and of a church like all souls is that we can encounter people in authentic relationships who are different from ourselves. And that is what is needed for the salvation of our humanity and of our world And dare I say, of our souls. One thing is for sure. This is not All Saints Church. I'm not good enough of a person or a minister to lead a group of saints. But it is a place that must do everything in its power to be a home for all souls. Thank you. I love you and I miss you. Amen. Thank you for joining us. For 100 years, All Souls in Tulsa has been a beacon of this free faith. We offer our services and programs freely online for all those who are interested. You can help us to do this by making a one-time gift today or a reoccurring pledge. We really appreciate you joining us and being a part of helping us make All Souls in Tulsa what it is. Thank you.
to take one more step till there is peace for us and everyone we need to take one more step Say one more word till every word is heard by everyone. We'll say one more word. One. Shared by everyone, we'll say one more prayer, one more song. We will sing one more song till every song, till every prayer till every word till there is peace